the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God. And to you all our spirit, all is our eternal, and on you no secrets are made. Many the thoughts of our hearts, by the inspiration of thy Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love thee, and worthily magnify thy holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Give us grace that we may cast away the works of darkness and put on us the armor of light, now in the time of this mortal life, in which thy Son, Jesus Christ, came to visit us in great humility, that in the last day, when he shall come again in his glorious majesty to judge both the quick and the dead, we may rise to the life immortal, through him who liveth and reigneth with thee and the Holy Ghost, now and ever. Amen. A reading from the Epistle of St. Paul to the Romans. Owe no man anything but to love one another. For he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. For this, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. And that, knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness, and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly, as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying, 
but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ, and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. This is the word of the Lord. When they drew nigh unto Jerusalem and were come to Bethpage, unto the Mount of Olives, then sent Jesus two disciples, saying unto them, Go into the village over against you, and straightway ye shall find an ass an tied and a colt with her, and loose them, and bring them unto me. And if any man say aught unto you, you shall say, The Lord hath need of them, and straight away he will send them. All this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell ye the daughter of Zion, Behold, thy king cometh unto thee meek, and sitting upon an ass, and the colt the fold of an ass. And the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them, and brought the ass and the colt, and put them on their clothes, and they set up and thereon. And a very great multitude spread their garments in the way. Others cut down branches from the trees and strode them in the way. And the multitudes that went before and that followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. Uh, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. 
Hosanna in the highest. And when he was come unto Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? And the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. And Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves and said unto them, It is written, My house shall be called the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. <laughs> name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Advent pulls the imagination in two directions. We turn our minds to the universal longing for God that is given voice in the Jewish scriptures, the yearning towards the desire of the nations. In the great cycle, Advent antiphons that begin with O Sapientia on the 16th of December. The phrase comes twice in the 6th and the 7th text. Rex Gentium, O King of Nations and their desire. O Emmanuel, desire of all nations and their salvation. And at the same time, Woe unto you who desire the day of the Lord and who may abide the day of his coming, for he is like a refiner's fire. And in this morning's gospel, again, a reference to Christ's kingship and his coming kingdom. Tell he the daughter of Zion, behold, thy king cometh. So here we have it again, a reference on Advent Sunday to the whole concept of Christ's kingship and kingdom and what we can expect. A week after the church celebrated the feast of Christ the King. By the way, a relatively new feast in the church, dating back to Pope Pius VI in 1925. It was created to make a sort of bookend for the Pentecost season, the day of Pentecost at one end and Christ the King at the other. And of course that begs the question on this Advent Sunday, why are we still harboring on and harking on about this coming King? Are we perhaps lingering where we should be moving on? The big celebration is done, surely. The time of quiet Advent introspection is where we're at, or at least should be. I think not. At the start of Advent, it is especially helpful, once again, to stir up our souls to truly ponder just who and what it is that I'm waiting for. And if we listen very carefully, we will discover there's an un utterly unexpected twist in the tale. Things are not as they seem 
or possibly as we anticipate. That which is coming is of another kingdom and another world at one deep, deep sense. Sigmund Freud, that great theologian, believed that our concept of God is made up of our own projections. As he said, the human father writ large and projected against the sky. Over the centuries, quite a great deal of sorrow and misery have been caused by us thinking that our notions of God are correct, that we know and understand God fully. What I know is that God is entirely beyond my understanding. In a sense, I do know God, but I know God to be a total mystery. Centuries ago, rulers were understood to rule by God's will, the so-called divine right rulers. Indeed, early in scripture, the people need leaders, and so God gives kings and rulers who rule at God's pleasure. And if they fail at the task, God will replace them. Of course, lots of rulers in ancient days were thought to be actual gods. Obviously, none of the pharaohs, none of the Caesars, or divine emperors of Japan were gods. But Jesus, in his advent coming, does not come to bring us, in any sense, an actual divine Caesar or Pharaoh or Emperor. In fact, in an unexpected twist in the tale, Jesus comes to totally change our notion of what a leader is, of what society should be. Jesus Christ, King of the Jews, is not a name Jesus gives himself, and it is not one he seems to embrace. Here's the twist. Rulers have dominion. They dominate their subjects. Jesus comes to relate to us as brothers and sisters. In fact, as siblings, as family members. He does not call us servants, but friends. This is the one who is coming. Jesus is not a dominating force. In the kingdom that Jesus seems to build, we are all part of one body, one flesh. We all have a place. We all have a voice. God loves us all equally. As St. Paul tells us, in Jesus, God has reconciled all things. Nothing or no one is beyond God's love. And I battle with that sometimes. But Paul tells us more about this Jesus, this coming Messiah. He reminds us that we preach Christ crucified, a scandal to Jews and madness to Gentiles. Why a scandal? Why madness? It's about perspective. What we expect, who is coming. The faithful Jews were looking for Jesus as Messiah, a savior on earth. Jesus is supposed to lead a triumphant war against the Roman oppressor. It is scandalous to suggest that Messiah had not only failed to deliver, but had been killed 
in a most ignominious way. The Gentiles, the Greeks mostly, had this image of kings as gods, as invincible superhumans. A crucified Jesus does not fit that mold at all. Jesus is not only not superhuman, he died in disgrace on the cross. And here we are not only living with that fact, but celebrating it. Sensible people, like the Greeks, who try to hide the inconvenient fact. Lunatics would proclaim it. As we prepare for the season of Advent, we might reflect on the fact that all in all, Jesus was a profound disappointment to most. It's not what they were expecting. They got Jesus, and it was a cruel blow. This Advent is, would be good to reflect once again that the one who is coming is not and never will be a superversion of earthly rulers, a sort of improved and extreme version of human leadership. That trying to understand God's kingdom through the lens of our earthly systems of government, government will not help us understand God one little bit. And let us, this Advent, reflect again on this most uncomfortable truth. Jesus was a great disruptor, like his outrageous behavior in the temple this morning. A great destroyer of the status quo. But let me acknowledge that part of me is like the crowd that cheered and enjoyed the thought that Jesus was being crucified. And it is very difficult for any of us who have grown up with at least a modicum of privilege to want the status quo disrupted. We benefit from the things being the way they are. Injustice is not so intolerable when it happens to someone else, someone I don't know, someone far, far away. But it's good this Advent, as we await the coming Messiah, to be honest and admit the weight of our social injustice around issues of wealth, of food, of the use of the Earth's resources, of stewardship, to name a few, is becoming unbearable. Our status quo is toxic. It desperately needs to be disrupted. And it seems that if we don't disrupt it, nature will. The kingdom of God will. We need to let go of the Jesus we wait for. If it's the Jesus we want the king, the ruler, who rules our way and embraces and embrace that loving servant, shepherd of all, who is coming at the end of Advent and who will come again in the fullness of time to judge both the quick and the dead. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.
us pray for the whole state of Christ's church and for all according to their needs. Almighty God, who has taught us to pray for all men and has promised to hear the prayers of those who ask in faith, we beseech thee to look mercifully upon thy universal church and to inspire it with the spirit of truth, unity, and concord. We pray especially for the work of the church in this diocese and ask thy blessing on Tabo, our bishop, and Joshua, his suffragan. Lord, in thy mercy, we pray for the needs of those who live in this place and worship in this church. And especially we give thanks today for the dedication and commitment of our choir master and organist, Dion Irish, marking particularly his 50 years in this post. Lord, continue to bless and guide him in this role in our parish. Lord, in thy mercy. We pray for a right stewardship of the world thou hast created. We pray for the nations of the world and for their leaders that they may minister justice for the maintenance of righteousness and peace. At this time, we pray especially for the victims of the earthquake in Indonesia, the frightening famine in Somalia, and of the mass shootings in the United States. We ask that you bring peace of mind and relief to all these people. Grant, Lord, compassion, wisdom, and a real sense of unselfish service to all world leaders in the world. We pray for those elected to public office, both in our own land and throughout our continent, as we say, God bless Africa, guard her children, guide her leaders, and give her peace. For Jesus Christ's sake, amen. We beseech thee to bless both whom we love and those for whom we are bound to pray. Lord, in thy mercy. We beseech thee of thy goodness to send thy healing grace to all who suffer in body or in soul. Especially we pray for Rian van Veik, Michael Priam, Karen Williams, Tom Buerta, and Elise Lowes. Lord, in thy mercy. We commend to thy gracious keeping all those who have died in faith. Especially we pray for those whose years' minds fall this week. John Girdwood, Dorothy Skinner, Margie Inglis, Charmaine Taylor, Dorothy Fisher, Jonathan Alberts, Joan Wellstead, Elizabeth Schultz, Esther Thorne, Jonathan Burmeister, and Georgina Rue. Rest eternal grant unto them, O Lord, and let light perpetual shine upon them. We pray for those who will die in our city today, especially those who will die alone and unloved. Lord, in thy mercy. As we join our prayers with the unending intercession of the Blessed Virgin Mary and all thy saints, we pray that we may be partakers with them of thy heavenly kingdom. Merciful Father, grant these are our prayers, for Jesus Christ's sake, our only mediator and Amen. To prepare ourselves to celebrate the sacred mysteries, let us humbly confess our sins to Almighty God. We confess to God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed through our own grievous fault. Wherefore, we pray God to have mercy upon us. Almighty God, have mercy upon you, forgive you all your sins, deliver you from all evil, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you unto everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. I would like to remind you of our Advent carol service tonight at 7 p.m. and uh, suggest you invite, you invite friends and family to that beautiful service. And please don't forget to return your amended dedication and pledge forms or if you haven't taken your 
yours, please, sir, mine.
It is very meet, right, and our bounden duty that we should at all times and in all places give thanks unto thee, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who, when he humbled himself to come among us, as a man fulfilled the plan thou didst form long ago and opened for us the way of salvation. Now we watch for the day, hoping that the salvation promised us will be ours when Christ our Lord will come again in glory. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify thy glorious name evermore praising thee and saying. in the same night that he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of this, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for you and for many for the remission of sins. Do this as oft as he shall drink it, in remembrance of me.
by whom and with whom, in the unity of the Holy Ghost, all honor and glory be unto thee, O Father Almighty, world without end. As our Saviour Jesus Christ hath commanded and taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth, as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us. Lord Jesus Christ, you said to your apostles, I leave you peace, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and grant us the peace and unity of your kingdom, where you live forever and ever. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And with our spirit.
We do not presume. is the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. Happy are those who are called to his supper. Lord, Lord God, we have received you. May we say the word, thou shalt be healed.
thanks unto the Lord for he is gracious. Favor, most holy Trinity, on this our act of worship and service, and may the sacrifice set forth before thine eyes be acceptable to thy divine majesty, and avail for us and all for whom we have offered it, who livest and reignest, one God, world without end. Amen. 